uh, the general context of the project. So first, we have uh, the literature review and then the numerical model. In the numerical model, we have uh, three big components. One is the material characteri characterization, which is done by performing laboratory testing uh, on the materials that are used in the, in the model. Then the, we use Abacus to perform our simulations, and then we have accurate input in order to be uh, as accurate as we can. And then we have contact stress measurement and load deflection course, course, which is kind of like the main topic if we want to compare the damage created by each of the two tires. Uh, we also validate our models using the experimental measurements from the APT and the data that has been made available to us by the participants of, of the project. And then with that information, we create an experimental database, which pretty much consists of a set of payment structures with the corresponding instrumentation um, and the experimental measurements that were performed on those. But this is not only composed by data are made available to us by the participants of the project. It also, we have some what we call additional, additional data, which, is, which are sections, again, instrumented and tested uh, under the, this project. And then we conclude with the calculation of the pavement damage. So in the next slides, I will just give some more details uh, on each of the blue boxes in this slide. Experimental database. So we have the participants of the project made uh, a database of measurements available to us for, for validation. And it's composed by the Virginia Smart Road data and the payment sections uh, uh, that we built here in, in our testing facility, uh, composed by the full depth sections and the thin sections. And coming from Davis, UC Davis and the Florida DOT, we have measurements of permanent deformation profiles. And um, finally, the Ohio SPSA sections, which uh, tested, uh, measured the shear strength area about each of the two, these two types. Uh, all this data, they come from, they use dual tire assembly and wide base tires, but they usually are not the same kind of, of tire or use the same kind of instrumentation, so there's some variation in this, but what the project is doing is compiling all this information to make it available for, for people to use. Then the laboratory testing, this is uh, done to, with each uh, of these new sections that we're building. So the section from Florida, uh, Davis, and Ohio, we collected uh, samples were made available for us in the form of compacted samples or loose mix. And we were able to determine the mixed volume metrics, uh, the, same, the SCB, the dynamic modulus test, and also a part of the, of the data available to us is the cross and isotropic strain dependent characterization of the granular materials in order to have a better um, um, characterization of the, of the granular materials. I will give more details later on. The proposed payment sections, I briefly mentioned there are three. One is Ohio in, in northern, north of Columbus. There are three instrumental payment sections, um, and there are full depth sections. So the thing is varies between 12 and 15 inches of AC. UC Davis and Florida DOT, UC Davis used, um, uh, reclaim asphalt pavement and Florida DOT, uh, we have two uh, thin overlays. Regarding the input of the, for the finite element modeling, um, based on the work performed in, in our group in the past 10 years, we have identified a series of inputs that affect uh, the results of the payment response. This includes the three-dimensional contact stresses. Uh, we uh, perform dynamic analysis in opposition to quasi-static or static analysis, viscoelastic characterizations of the asphalt materials instead of um, linear elastic assumption, continuous moving load, so the load is moving in the wheel path in a continuous way, not hammering the load as impact loads. We also consider layer interaction between each of the layers and nonlinear granular materials for the, for the base. So these 3D contact stresses, this specific topic is the, it will be the focus of the second uh, part of the presentation. <laughs> Once we have the calculation of the payment response coming from the validated finite element model and the, the 
the experimental sections, we are able to calculate the damage using the transfer functions. After that, um, an artificial neural network will be used to predict the responses of payment damage that is, that is created by each of the tires for scenarios that are not tested either in the numerical model or were not built in the experimental sessions. And as part of this project, we are also performing a life cycle assessment and life cycle analysis. So now more details regarding the experimental database. First, this is a, a tool like this. This is like how it looks in a general sense. Uh, will be part of the deliverables of the project, which pretty much compile all the measurements, not only of the proposed sections, but also the, the existing section, the data that was made available to us. So, so far, this is I just show um, what I mentioned before as the existing payment sections, but these two will add later on the experimental measurements that were already tested for the, uh, in this project. This slide shows um, a summary of the APT that, are, that was performed as part of this project. Remember, we have three um, testing sites, let's call it, one in UC Davis, the other one in, in Florida, which is to the two of them APT, and the third one in Ohio, which is the control um, load truck test. So this picture just shows the HVS machine um, that was used. I think that one is Davis. This is the control load test. So pretty much we have the instrumental payment section here. This is in Ohio. And we use trucks that are that use both type of tires that we are using. And we uh, load the trucks with, with sand in order to, to have the, the desired load level that we want to accomplish. This is just samples of the instrumentation. We have uh, MDDs, multi-depth deflectometers that were used in UC Davis. We also have strain gauges. We try to use the same. We use the same type of gauges for all the instrument payment sections. And we also have a strain gauge process in order to be able to measure the shear strain based on the components that each of the uh, foil gauges are measuring. And also we have thermocouples in order that to determine the temperature profile in the pavement and pressure cells. These are the two tested tires, probably this slide should have been before, but these are the two tires that we're comparing. We have the wide base tire, uh, 445, and the dual tire assembly, the 275. These tires were provided by the Rubber Manufacturer Association, which are, are one of the contributors of the project, and were donated based on an agreement between them. And these are the two tires that we are using in this study. This is the loading metric. So this, um, Values of inflation pressure and loading were the one used, the ones used not only to measure the contact stresses between the tire and the pavement, but also during the APT testing and a smaller version of this during the control, the track control test in Ohio. We can see that we have a wide range of inflation pressure that goes from 552 kilopascals to 162. That's around 80, between 80 and 125 psi. And the applied load varies between 27 and 80 kilonewtons, which is between 6 and 18 kips. It's been uh, found that the, the dual tire assembly with a different inflation pressure in each of the tires of the assembly create a higher amount of damage. So we also included uh, uh, two of these cases that aim to represent that, that loading condition. The testing, the, the, what we want to get from the testing is how the mixes are performing and also the material characterization to use uh, in the model. So the dynamic modulus test uh, is performed on, in the case where we have loose mixes and we can create the appropriate sample size to perform the test. But when that is not the case, we can get samples from the core so, and we can perform the IDT. Either of these two tests, will allow us to determine the chronic series coefficient that we be used at the end of the day in the, in the final element model. And also to check the performance at low temperature, we use the SCB test. Now moving on to the pavement modeling. Here I'm just going to give a brief summary of the, and a little bit more details of the variables that we consider in our model. So first is the viscoelastic uh, asphalt layer and the nonlinear base. 
Uh, this is just for the specific case of the team payments. Since this create uh, the model for when we consider this non-linearity is a little bit more challenging, so we just decided to use uh, this kind of characterization for the team payment when it's the, the stress, the level of stresses in the in the in the in the base makes this um, parameter relevant. We have moving load, uh, layer interaction between the layers, infinite elements. These are used in the boundary of the model in order to reduce the size and the number of elements that are needed to create the, the, the vanishing of the responses in the boundary of the payment. And probably the most relevant in order to compare the two types the three-dimensional tripermian contact stress. And also the temperature distribution in the AC layer. So this is just a snapshot of the whole model. We see how we have a denser mesh along the wheel path, and we have a transition in the element signs from around the loaded area to the boundary of the, of the model. We can also see how we have infinite elements at the boundaries of the model that, again, allow us to satisfy the, the, the assumption of the infinite half space with less amount of ele elements and less uh, number of elements. This is just a detail of the, of the contact loads. Uh, you can see here that we are using uh, point loads in the nodes instead of uh, contact stresses, and I will come to that issue and the explanation why we did this uh, in the second part of the presentation. So the input. We have two sets of sec We have a set of sections that were built, and we collect the samples in order to have an appropriate characterization of the of the materials, but for the cases that we model, that will allow us to have the, the extreme cases for the neural networks, we use the LTPP database. This database has around a, a thousand mixes, and based on this, we selected the extreme cases. Uh, I should point out here that neural networks doesn't allow you to extrapolate. So, in order for you to have a a good uh, neural network model, you have you need to go to the extreme. So your prediction is is accurate. So that's why we went to the extremes. And we use, we, we select the materials for each of the, of the layers in the payment structure based on two criteria. First, the representative of the extreme cases without going to the completely extremes. And then the nominal maximum aggregate size, the typical nominal maximum aggregate size for each of the layers of the of the payment. This information, all this information is available in the LTPP database that anybody can have access to. This is just a plot of the set of mixes used in, for the AC materials, and the strong and the, and the weak case. Uh, for the case of the granular materials, uh, as I mentioned before, for the case of thick payments, we use the cross anisotropic stress dependent characterization. And this is based on a database uh, made available to us thanks to uh, Professor Tumbles' research group. And based on that, we follow the procedure again to determine a weak and a strong um, base materials. These uh, the materials in this database um, not only is nonlinear, it's dependent, assuming it's isotropic, but also having a variation of the properties with the direction. This is like just summarize the artificial neural networks. So we have the experimental measurements that represent the intermediate cases, cases that, that were actually built. And then the infinite, the finite element model will give us the extreme cases. So extreme cases of loading, extreme cases of material properties. And all these will be used to, to develop the artificial neural networks. And at the end of the day, what we're gonna have is, is a tool that we allow us to input the material properties, the type of tire, the loading, and the payment structure, and it will calculate the stresses and the strain, the critical stresses and the strain, the ones that are linked to, to payment damage, such as the tensile strain at the bottom of the AC, and the payment damage. So what are the, the outcomes of the project? First, a, a database to access the measure uh, payment responses, this will be uh, available for the public, and as I mentioned before, not only with the data made available to us by the participants of the project, but also the new experimental measurements. We will have a validated uh, three-dimensional finite element model 
validated using the, the instrumented sections. Also an analysis tool that will allow us and the users and engineers to compare the damage created by white based tire and dual tire, dual tire assembly. And finally, a life cycle analysis and life cycle assessment. Life cycle cost assessment. Now we're going to move on to the second part of the presentation, which is to give you more details regarding the information that we can, uh, that we obtain from the experimental measurement of the tire impairment contact stresses. So the first thing is that even though measuring contact stresses is fairly used in the automotive uh, and the car industry, there are not many efforts, research efforts, focused on measuring these contact stresses for truck tires. This is because the, the loading um, is, is different. The, the loading is uh, way higher for trucks than for, but for cars. So this creates some, some challenges. Then, also, if we want to have a fair comparison be between the two tires to have an appropriate characterization of these, uh, contact stresses is really important. So that's why we spend a um, good amount of time and effort to have an appropriate characterization of the, of the contact stress. Uh, as of now, the three-dimensional contact stresses are not considered in impairment design. So the, the MEPDG, what considers is a circular load, and based on the actual measurement of the footprint, we know that the the actual contact area between the tire and the pavement is not circular. On top of that, the, the contact stresses are assumed to uh, act only in the vertical direction, and they are constant in magnitude, which has been also shown that does not uh, represent what how the, the actual behavior at the contact between the tire and the pavement. And it's, uh, it has been shown that the, these assumptions underestimate the surface response. And on top of that, uh, some other studies have, have concluded that the, the three-dimensional contact stresses do affect the, the payment responses. So we have the scenario where, first, we don't have the right assumptions for the, for the contact stresses between the time of the payment, and we do know that they are important. But measuring contact stresses is not an easy task. First, not, there are not many equipments available, and uh, it's expensive. So that's why, first, uh, we need appropriate characterization of the contact stresses between the tire payment to have a fair comparison between the two tires. And on top of that, we need analytical expression or simplifying methods that will allow us to consider this, um, this effect in our payment analysis. Not everybody has access to, to three-dimensional contact stresses or are able to measure these stresses. So that will be, this will be the focus of the rest of the presentation. First, I'm going to have a brief uh, summary of the experimental results, and you can have uh, more details in the paper published in the TDI conference in 2013. And then um, our first attempt to have analytical expressions for the three-dimensional contact stresses, which were, will be published this year and was presented in TRB uh, last week. So just a reminder, for, uh, for the analytical expressions, we used the same uh, testing matrix, but we did not use the, the dual tire assembly uh, with the differential inflation pressure. This is just pretty much the same testing matrix with the same values of load and inflation pressure. This is the measuring equipment. It's composed, it has a nominal area of 800 millimeters by 417. It has a 1,020 uh, supporting fins, which are the, the dark the dark circles. And then 21 instrumented fins that are lined here uh, in the middle of the assembly part. The actual system is called dual stress in motion system, the, the one that we use to measure the contact stresses. And it's composed by two of these parts, as we can see in this in this picture. So we have here in this case the dual tire assembly. We have the two assembly parts. These are uh, the instrumented pins, and in, in the middle of the pad, each of these pads uh, has 21 instrumented pins. So we have a total of 42 instrumented pins. We have the HVS machine here, which is in charge of applying the load that I, in, that I showed in the previous testing matrix, 
and the assessing the the measuring system is here. So the tire rolls over the over the assembly pad. Um, this is uh, the instrumental pin that will be measuring the contact stresses, the contact loads. So we have uh, strain gauges in each of the three directions that we allow us to to calculate the, the contact force. Some remarks regarding the, the experimental program. First, the lateral position of the tire was fixed. So when the tire was rolling on the measuring system, we also, we, all the tire was aimed to have in the same uh, lateral position. The, the pin, each of the instrumented pins measured the, the applied force in the three uh, perpendicular directions, the longitudinal, vertical, and transverse direction. The average speed is 1.2 kilometers per hour, which is a, a limitation of, of the system, and, and it has some effects that I will be discussing later on. The sample frequency is uh, 1 kilohertz per channel, and this allows us to have a good definition of the variation of the contact stress with the contact length. As part of the experimental program, the contact area for each of the, of the loading cases in the test matrix was measured, and each load combination in that uh, testing matrix was repeated 10 times. And the optimal three repetitions were used for analysis. How did we define the optimum three? It's just the three repetitions that the resultant from the measurements of the pins will give us the closest uh, value to the applied load by the HVS machine. This is just a sample of the filtering procedure. In the left-hand side, we both plots show the variation of the vertical contact stresses uh, with the length of the tire. We have with the the blue, green, and red lines are the, each of the three samples, the optimal three, and the black line is the filter um, the filter data. We see how there's a how there's a small shift in the data, but the contact length is not, did not change, and the peak value did not change. Did not change. This is just the detail of the three repetitions with uh, the black line, which is the, the filter uh, variation. So this is the issue, this is the explanation of why we use uh, contact loads instead of contact stresses in the, in the FEM. So we know how it, each of these pink uh, circles uh, represents uh, one of the measuring pins. In order to, for you to calculate the stresses, you have to divide the load of each pin by the influence area. But it's hard to keep track of the value of this influence area if the pin is located at the edge of the rim. For the, for the pin in the center, it's, it's relatively easy. But in order to have an accurate value for, for pins at the edge of the rim, you need to keep really good track of the position in, in, that, in that direction. So you cannot divide by the whole influence area because you are affecting the value of the contact stresses uh, by a factor of two. But not only that, but you can see that the, the thread pattern of the tire varies. So it, the, the contact, the influence area of each of the pins is not the, is not the same as the tire is rolling over the pins. So that's why we decided to go with the contact stress per unit width, which is pretty much not dividing uh, by the by the, the influence area, but multiplying by the by the separation between each of the pins. This is just a, a snapshot of the procedure to calculate the the contact area. Uh, I previously showed when I was comparing the circular and the actual footprint how we obtain the measure contact area. Well, we have uh, in the report the like a, a picture of this um, contact area. Uh, we import we imported all these drawings in AutoCAD. We properly properly scaled them, and then we were able to measure the the actual contact area between the tire, each of the tires, and the trainer. And regarding the contact length. We, since this contact area was measured under a static load, we did not use this length, this length as the contact length, but we used the variation of the vertical contact stresses to define the actual contact length between the tire and the pin. This slide just uh, compares the load carried by each rib um, 
for just uh, two ex the two extreme values of the of the apply load. So this is pretty much if in, in one specific grid there are three measuring pins, we um, calculate the total resultant on each um, specific grid. So that's why the, the vertical axis show the, the ratio between the load carried by that specific pin and the total applied load. The, the two plots on the left are correspond to the y based tire. That's why we have eight ribs. And the two plots on the right are for the dual tire assembly. That's why we have 10 ribs. And we can see how for the low uh, value of load of 27 uh, kilonewtons, we see how the, the center of the, of the tire carries most of the load. But once you increase the load to 80 kilonewtons, the, the edge of the tire is the one carrying the mo uh, most amount of load. We can also see how the inflation pressure does not have a big effect on how the load is distributed ac across the tire for these two cases. And then another, a very important issue, which is the, the transfer contact stresses. As I mentioned before, and we, are, we all are aware, the payment design does not consider uh, the transfer contact stresses. But this slide shows how this uh, is, the, the, the magnitude of this um, the stresses in the transfer direction have a, very, a significant magnitude. So the vertical axis just shows the, the, the peak value of the transfer contact stress normalized with the inflation pressure. And the horizontal axis, the, the maximum vertical, uh, the maximum value of the vertical contact stress normalized with the inflation pressure. And we have four gray lines that shows uh, this line, if, if a point lies on this line, it's because the, the transfer, the peak transfer is 40% the peak, uh, the peak vertical. This line corresponds to 20% and this line corresponds to 20%. So we can see how there are values that are close to 40%, which is, is significant in magnitude and we cannot omit them during the design. This is just the exact same plot for the same value of applied load. Uh, but for the case of the dual tire assembly, we can also see how the variation is between uh, 10 and 40 percent, even though it's more spread for the case of the dual tire than the white base. And this is just a summary of all the cases. So pretty much we have in the left-hand side the peak longitudinal uh, contact stress, and on the right-hand side the peak transfer contact stress. The ratio between that peak value and the, the peak value of the vertical contact stress. So we can see, for example, for the case of the white base, uh, in the transfer, uh, the peak transfer contact stress compared to the peak uh, vertical contact stress, the variation is between around 15 and um, 32 percent. So we see how all the cases, most of the cases, fall um, between this band, and we can find a band for each of the cases. So the message of this is like this. First, uh, that the data uh, contact stresses in the two perpendicular directions, they are not only in the vertical direction, and also that the magnitude of these stresses is relevant. It's, it can be as high as uh, 37%. We also compare um, the contact length and the contact area. So each of these uh, two plots, the one on top is the contact length, and the one at the bottom, the, the contact area. The vertical axis of each plot for the, for the dual tire assembly and the horizontal axis for the wide base tire. In the case of the contact length, we see that there's a strong linear relationship between the, the average contact length of the two tires and the contact length of the average contact length of the dual tire assembly is about 90% the one of the wide base tire. And at the bottom, we can see how the contact area of the dual tire assembly is uh, always higher than for the white base tire, and it can be as high as 30%. So now moving on to the analytical expression. What I just explained is a summary of the, of the experimental results. But then we, we wanted to tackle the issue of how do we make this data easy enough for everybody to use. So first, we need to have like a representative expression for the variation of the vertical and transfer contact stresses for each rib. So, because we didn't want to have an expression for each uh, measuring, measurement of each pin in, the, in, in, the, in, in both tires. 
So we pretty much did uh, a weighted average of the of the resultants. So we, for example, in the case of the of the vertical, so we just calculated the the resultant and uh, the variation in each pin and divided by the total resultant. And then we came up with the with the black line, which would be the one that would be fit. And we can see how it um, very well represents the value of the three pins in this specific grid. And we did follow the same procedure for the transfer, we, because we know that they, it changes the sign uh, at the edge of, the, of each rib. So we can also see how just with just one express, one variation, we represent the, the variation of the transfer contact stresses in, the, in, in that specific rib. So what we fitted was for each rib, for each of the loading cases in the table, in the testing table, we found an analytical expression to represent that variation. So, and we try to fit this expression, which comes from the literature uh, of um, a, a car types, the ones that um, doesn't have a big demand on, on load. So, if you want to go to the original expression, you can find it in this reference. This is a, a slightly modified in order to make it simple to use, and it um, satisfies our our needs for the for this specific case of uh, testing types. So in this we have in this expression we have we're going to represent the variation of both the vertical and transfer uh, contact stress per unit width. We have an applied load, which is the P. 2A is the contact length, so pretty much A is the is half contact length, and the center of the coordinate system is the middle of the of the of the of the contact length. And the parameter that is uh, defining the contact length is, is she. So she is zero at the center of the tire and varies between minus one and one. And N and alpha are just fitting parameters. And this shows the performance of the fitting. So for each of the two cases, we have the coefficient of correlation. The green squares uh, are the coefficient of correlation for, for the transfers, for the fitting of the transfer contact stresses, and the blue circles, the, the variation, the, the coefficient of determination for the, for the vertical contact stress per unit width. The plot on the left is for the Y base, and the plot on the right is for the dual thrust. And we can see how it's, the fit is performing very well. The lowest value is 0.72, if I remember well, in the case of the Y, and for the dual is 0.80 something. And this is, if we keep in mind that this comes from experimental data, it's, 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 not, it's not bad. And also another point is that we, these are the, the coefficient of determination for all the ribs, all the loading cases. And we notice how for the ribs at the edge of the tire, the, the value of the R squared is smaller. So maybe if we exclude those, the, I'm pretty sure, uh, uh, these values uh, are for uh, edge ribs. So we will have a better performance if we don't include those edge ribs. So here, keep in mind in this expression that we have two fitting parameters, N and alpha. So we decided to go uh, one step further and try to fit each of these parameters with the, with the applied load, P, and the inflation pressure. So in the case of the parameter alpha, um, we assume a quadratic variation with the applied load and the tire inflation pressure. And in the case of N, we assume a linear variation. In order to fully determine the interaction between the tire and the pavement, we also need a contact length. And based uh, on some analysis, we determined that the inflation pressure did not affect this um, contact length significantly, significantly. So we decided to assume a linear variation with the load of the, of the contact length. This table summarizes the, the R square of uh, each of these fits. It's not as good as in the case of the general expression, but um, we think it's, a, it's, 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 not, it's acceptable. It's, it's something that we can still use to, to have a better representation of the tire pavement contact stress distribution. So this is just a summary of how to use uh, this procedure to determine the contact stresses. First, you define your loading case. This is pretty much the value of applied load and tire inflation pressure. 
you define which tile you want to use. You, you want to find the contact spaces. If the Y based on the door, and then the rib, but usually you, you want the, the, the distribution for all the, all the tiles, so you will end up doing it for, for all the ribs. So with that, you determine the, the, K, the K and C values that are in these expressions, the K and the C values, and we also determine the D values in order to find the contact length. The values of the K, C, and D values are tabulated in, in the paper. I didn't include them to, um, it will be a, a too busy slide, but they are tabulating the paper. Once we have that, with the value of light load and inflation pressure, you can go to the formulas that I just showed and find alpha and n, and also find the contact line. And once you have all this information, you can plug in the general expression to have the the, the, the expression for the for the variation of the contact stress per unit width. With that, uh, I would like to move on to the concluding remarks. First is that a comprehensive approach needs to be carried out in order to have a fair comparison between the dual tires and the white base. It's not only modeling, it's also modeling, experimental measurements, material characterization, and also uh, how it's implemented, how we make the data accessible to, to engineers, which was is being accomplished by the analysis tool. Also that if we want a, a, to evaluate the payment damage of each of the tires, the characterization of the interaction between the, the tire and the pavement is extremely important. We, there is just no way that we can have a fair comparison if we don't have a good representation of this phenomenon. Then the, the tire pavement contact stresses are three-dimensional and they are not uniform. So it's completely different than how it's currently assuming the in pavement analysis and design. And also, we uh, have a, our first attempt to simplify uh, the use, how we use this contact expression using closed form uh, expression. Finally, some acknowledges, some the acknowledgement, uh, the Federal Highway Administration, the Rover Manufacturer Association, and the Department of Transportation involved in this full-time study, Illinois, Minnesota, Montana, New York, Oklahoma, Virginia, and Texas. With that, if anybody has any questions. Um, each pin is each pin has 